Heavenly Father, God, I love you. God, I praise you. Father, I just pray that uh, as uh, Adam comes up tonight, God, that uh, God, you give him boldness, Lord, to just uh, speak truth tonight. Father, I pray that you speak through him. God, I pray that you are the one that gets all the glory tonight. Uh, Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This is going to get interesting. You know that video game Frogger? I just gave your age away. I don't believe you. All right. Hey, can we give them another hand, please, man? That's... It's awesome. So tonight's message is called 2020 Vision. Pick it up when I'm going down. Art credit to Bruce Stanley. Thank you, sir. That's good. And I just wanted to, this is going to be a disaster right here. I just wanted to, uh, every year in January, I want to recast vision because a mentor of mine said that vision leaks. And I want to recast vision about um, what we believe about addiction and why. Uh, not only that, but we're going to talk about some of the new stuff that S2L is doing. Is it doing it again? It's good. All right. I have a backup mic somewhere. There it is. Uh, and so I'm excited. This is a night that I love to do. But in January, I'm not going to speak because we have a guest speaker on the 16th, uh, Sarah Keel. She works for the State of Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, and she is on fire for Jesus. And she has a story um, of redemption, and she's going to come. We also have Stacia coming to do worship that night. So the 16th, mark your calendars, man, be here. So let me pray, and we're going to dive in. Father in heaven, as we, as we gather this Thursday, just the day after we celebrated your gift to the world, God, I pray that our minds and our hearts, we could focus here. God, I ask that you speak through me, make little of me, God, and more of you. God, I pray that you are pleased with what we're speaking about. God, I pray that um, as your word goes out, I pray that people respond. God, I love you, and I praise you again. God, make little of me and more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me break this down. Here is the vision of S2L. Our vision at, at Spring to Life is to see addictions. Is it doing it? It doesn't sound bad? Good. Our vision at S2L is to see addictions exchanged for a life liberated in Christ because the appeal of sin is no longer desirable. Here's our mission. It is the mission, duty, and purpose of S2L to illuminate the life of freedom that is offered through Christ using biblical training, innovative pastoral counseling, licensed professional counseling, medical supervision, certified peer recovery specialist, and residential discipleship for anyone suffering from addictions. Now, these have been altered a little bit over the years, but these are our foundational truths, and we're going to break down why. One of the things that we've added this year is called the non-negotiables. Um, anybody ever heard of non-negotiables? Uh, to be honest, I heard it from, I want to say, Tim Tebow Foundation. And I just saw it, and I was like, you know what? We need to have some things that we are going to stand on that we're not going to waver on. You heard Bruce talk about it last week in his message. So these five things are something that S2L came up with this year that we will not waver ever. These are our non-negotiables. Number one. S2L will stand on the Word of God without compromise. Here's what that means. We will turn to the Word of God as an absolute standard of truth. Why? Because we know that addiction is not a surprise to God. And He's given us His Word to set us free, and it's sufficient for finding freedom from bondage. (coughs) Here's here's a passage. It's not up here. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth... Okay, well, here's what... Jesus says about that in John 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So we're going to stand on the word of God. 
Number two, non-negotiable. S2L's recognition of Christ as the center of our integrative program. We will not incorporate partnerships, medical or therapeutic practices, behavior, or individuals who threaten compromise to the integrity of that non-negotiable tenet of our mission. Here's why. Colossians 1, 17 through 22. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Non-negotiable number three. S2L's commitment to a doctrine of Christian servitude as leaders, practitioners, and teachers, and staff, and students. The commitment to serve the ministry, our brothers and sisters, and a greater good as a whole is not compromised for individual gain or agenda. Joshua 24, 15 says this, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Non-negotiable number four. S2L will never judge the circumstance that led someone to us. We will never treat someone differently because of the circumstances or actions taken that a life of addiction has caused. We know that people coming to us most of the time are in the darkest season of their life. Galatians 6 says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And here's non-negotiable number five that we will not waver. S2L will teach that identity is found in Christ and not your past. We know that identity is so important in everyday life for all people. We teach that our identity is in Christ and Christ alone. To believe that you are always going to be an addict or an alcoholic or announce yourself as such is antithetical of the word of God. See non-negotiable number one. That's what I put. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. All of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Those are our non-negotiables. What's mind-blowing to me is that we would be, we are chastised for these non-negotiables in the secular world of addiction recovery. Chastised. We're, we're, We're on the outer skirts of this. The opposite is taught, and it doesn't make sense to me. Here's our belief, S2L beliefs. We believe that addiction has developed as a result of people people seeking to meet their own basic human needs from the wrong source. To have true change, then we must take an inside-out approach and not a behavior modification approach. We believe that addiction is curable and not a lifelong ailment. God has given people dominion over the addiction. We believe that God desires to set people free from their addictions once and for all. How do we do this? What is our uh, method of getting there? Well, one, we, we, do, we have our curriculum called Lost and Found Recovery in Christ, right? I think I'm supposed to move over here. Y'all know that curriculum all too well. What's the, what's the scripture that it's based on? Someone's paid attention. Who said that? You don't count. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1. Listen to this. I'm going to read this just because it's the word of God, and it's almost like I could drop a mic and walk off the stage. Amen. Like, look at this scripture. I mean, Bruce, man, you can make good designs. You made my art. Bruce is brilliant in the way that God's made him. But what he made this curriculum is from the word of God, and that's why we use it. Hear what it says. Like, hear Don't just listen. I want you to hear something. 
Verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises, promises of God. Preach them to yourselves on a daily basis. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. I'm going to read that again. You can escape from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. And if you've ever struggled with chemical dependence, that desire is hard to articulate, right? It's just a desire deep within. And what the Word of God just said is that you can escape these sinful desires. Let's go. That's what it says. Well, how do you do that? Here's what it says. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. What does supplement mean? Add to to your faith virtue, and with virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and with godliness, brotherly affection, and with brotherly affection, with love. Those are the seven principles. So we teach these things. We don't teach, hey, you need to... Make sure that you uh, make everyone aware in a room in a meeting that you're going to that you are an alcoholic or an addict, and you need to chant a prayer that you don't really know what it means fully, Um, and you just need to talk about how bad things are. Man, God says that you're more than a conqueror, not a victim. And if we believe this, that we can escape these things, then there is freedom in Christ. So we proclaim it, and we're on the outskirts. But it's true. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. That's our curriculum. And man, it speaks for itself. And I know you guys have like, this has been beaten into your heads, right? These scriptures. Well, how do I grow in virtue? How do I grow in knowledge? How do I grow in brotherly affection? How do I grow in love? Well, that's important because the Bible said that you should grow in these things. Why? Because that's peeling layers out of the heart. That's going on the inside and showing some things that you need to do to grow in your walk with Christ and sanctification, right? That's not outside and behavior modification, Go to this many meetings in 90 days, whatever it may be, right? Work this amount of steps, do this kind of stuff. That stuff is good, and and it doesn't sound like that. I'm not a big fan, but I don't want to bash that stuff because it can help. But, man, if, if, if you're taking away the highest power, which in a lot of those rooms, I was told that my doorknob could be my higher power. There's no power in that room. They're not talking about God. They're talking about false gods. Talking about self-help. <laughs> self-help. If I could help myself, I wouldn't be in the room in the first place, right? So what's the other way? That, that's our curriculum, and what's, our, what's, what's a way that we really drive that? Well, it's the four pillars. The four pillars that we say, if you do these things on a daily basis, man, it's going to equip you to be strengthened. And what are they? Be in God's Word every single day. Pray. Have a prayer life. A relationship prayer life. Have good fellowship every day and and walk in what God's called you to. The call to action, walk in that every single day. Those are things that you could do every day. And I don't have time to give all these classes and the four pillars, but these are the things that drive our mission and our vision, right? So we believe, like I said, it's got to be from the inside out. It's got to be a heart cleanse. Psalms 37, 4 and 5 say this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. So when I was very young in my faith, in my mind, I don't know that I ever said this out loud, but in my mind, I definitely said, um, well, the desires of my heart is a Ferrari, and God never gave it to me, or a Porsche, or whatever it may be. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm delighting myself in the Lord, but I wasn't. I was delighting myself in what? A Ferrari or self-gain. And only way that I could describe this is when you surrender everything to God, when you've given your life to him, we're going to dive into this in just a minute, the, the desires of your heart change. It's like a DNA change. And God gives you desires. Like, for example, um, and this is silly, but I'll be fast. Um, early on, the desires of my heart was to be rich. Just wealth was my lowercase g, God. When God saved me from me, and I began to seek him and, and, and really want to know more about him and put my mind on him, my desires changed. Like, I remember tearing up about things and, that I never would have. Like, I had emotional things about someone else winning in life, to where before it was like, I've got to do everything I can so I can win, which means normally stepping on someone's face or stepping over them or celebrating it when they lose. And I remember just getting emotional and seeing someone else just doing good. And I was so competitive, and it was just like, that was counterculture. Or just, just those kind of, I, I can't explain it except for it feels like a DNA change. And then the second part of that, though, is commit your way to the Lord. I think that's where a lot of people... They want to get the desires of their heart. They want God to give them the desires of their heart, but they're not willing to commit or trust. Trust in God, and the, the Word of God just said, and He will what? Is the verse not up there anymore? You weren't listening the first time? Act. Trust in God. Commit your way to Him, and He will act. The one that spoke everything into existence is telling us, hey, delight yourself in me. Delight yourself in me and I'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit and trust and I will move. That's a star breather telling you on your behalf. The promises of God are important. Remember, I will move if you trust and you commit your way to me. Are you kidding me? Just even talking about this God over the universe, addiction seems so small. When God says he'll move, man, it's this desire of the heart. That's why we always say, the Bible talks about if you first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. And Jesus wasn't given dishwashing instructions. He's talking about the heart. So all of the things that we do at us to are designed to get to that spot first and quickly. And sometimes it stings, doesn't it? Sometimes it's emotional, isn't it? But get there quickly and let's clean the inside out. And how? Not by legalistic or religious type things. You give it and you clean it by giving it to the Lord. You can't, you can't scrub it. It's got to be washed by God. All right, well, what about all of this once and for all stuff? I don't know about that. I've been ingrained in my head that I'm an addict. and I'll, Once you're an addict, you're always an addict. Yet we don't say that about any other situation, do we? Romans chapter 6. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's a, here's a big sentence. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. It sounds like an option, doesn't it? It sounds like that you've been, as a believer, what Paul's saying, that there's options. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. Why would he put that in there if you had no choice and you're a victim? I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm powerless. I'm powerless. No, he's saying, don't let it do this. And we're going to talk about how in a minute. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. That's what baptism is, is a symbol. You've been, you've been crucified and buried and rose with Christ. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. And here's an awesome one. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under law but under grace. 
you will never hear any of the S2L staff say this, ever. Hello, my name is Adam, and I'm an addict or an alcoholic. Again, gosh, whenever we do the vision cast, it, it, it almost sounds like we're picking a fight, but I'm going to shout it from the rooftops because that is unbiblical. And even if we just take faith out of it psychologically, what is that doing to people? This is an epidemic. People are dying. And yet, if you've been anywhere before you came here and it wasn't a faith-based place, more than likely, what were you instructed to do? That, to fit in. And in fact, some places wouldn't allow you to speak if you didn't say that. I've been asked to leave. Man, we won't say that because the Bible says that sin will no longer have dominion over me. We won't say that because the Bible says that you are a new creation like we just read. Why am I identifying with a dead man? Why would I identify with the guy who's been crucified with Christ? I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live to him. So then I'm not an addict. That guy's dead. He's passed away. The old has passed away. Now, what we're not saying is that part of our life didn't exist. <clears throat> we're not saying that the people and the things and the circumstances and the situations that you created in an addiction didn't really happen. And guess what, man? The consequences are real. Even as you're walking as a new creation, sometimes you have to face some of the seeds that were sowed. Anybody relate with that? And that's heavy sometimes, isn't it? Man, I'm not that guy anymore. Like, my DNA's changed. I don't even, that disgusts me now, but I still have to deal with financial, relational, all of these things. And that's the truth. I'm not ever going to say that that's not the case. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with these things, but the good news is what? Man, you have one walking with you now. You have the knowledge that you're not that. That you can begin to make some sort of amends in life. And sometimes you can't. But that's when the word of God and what God thinks of you has to outweigh what people think of you. Man, the day after Christmas, we're here talking about 2020 vision, and I'm going to call all of us to some action here at the end, but I want you to know the promises of God are important. Preach them to yourselves daily. Daily. Uh, that verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I'll just read it again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the Greek word behold is I do or I do, E-I-D-O. And, and that just means literally, it means um, an observable, observable objective fact is about to be stated. So behold, a fact, objective fact is about to be stated. And then he says, the new has come. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has passed away. Hey, a fact, the new is here. Man, that should give you hope. Especially with looking back 24 hours and celebrating the birth of Christ and that he came to give you this hope, this baby. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what does all of this mean? And I think we try to proclaim biblical truths and then explain them, make them practical. And if you're thinking, you know what, I believe that, I don't feel it though. Know that that's okay. Know that you are where you're supposed to be, and I would even say that you're not in this room by surprise or by chance. In the book of Psalms, it says that God ordained the places and boundaries of time for his word to go out. It also says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. We weren't made to do silly things, though. We weren't made to bring us glory and to argue about silly stuff and to waste our time doing silly things. We were made to bring God glory. Think about that for a second. How much time do you waste? How much time do I waste doing silly things? 
And, and God made you to bring him glory, and he's given you gifts to do that. He says that good works have been made before time for you to walk into, but if you're too distracted online or with your job or with women or whatever it could be, anything that you put above God becomes your God and will fail you, and it's idolatry. Okay, well, still, I believe that, but I just don't feel it. What do you, how does this all work? How does this all work? Well, here's how it all works <coughs> in a nutshell. In the beginning, God created everything. He spoke it all into existence, and then, like I said, he made man in his image. Along the way, mankind stopped wanting to be like God, and they wanted to be God. And that's the great blasphemy of the universe. And before we get upset with Adam and Eve, we've all participated in sin, actively participated in sin. So we've been participants in this blasphemy of the universe. And so what God says is that you must be perfect. In Matthew, Jesus says, here's the standard, be perfect. Your Father in heaven is perfect. You must be perfect. And because of that sin, perfection was broken and separation from God. If you've ever been to a funeral or ever had a disease or ever anything involving that is because of one sin, in the beginning, perfection was broken. The world was cracked. And all of the pain, all of the shame, all of the sickness, all of the everything that you felt outside of perfection is because of sin and its originality. And with the standard being perfection, to, be, to close this gap back with God and be in perfect communion with God then the standard was perfection. Since no one can meet that standard but God, then God had to provide a way. And that's what we celebrated yesterday. God being the only one that can meet that standard enter, entered into his own creation as Jesus, the son, the baby. And he lived perfect for 33 and a half years. You read it. You can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You could see the things that he did in his ministry from age 30 to 33. He looked perfect. That was the standard because any sin, there was a blood uh, penalty. God demanded blood for sin because blood was life. We serve a just God and he's not going to let just wickedness get away from, from justice. That's why all in the Old Testament, you see these, these sacrifices, these sacrifices every year. They were sacrificing blood because that was what God commanded them to do. And it was all pointing to something. And what it was pointing to is what we celebrated yesterday. He entered into his own creation as Jesus, and he lived, and he grew up, and he lived perfect, not a blemish, no sin. And he went to the cross willingly at 33. And what blows my mind, and I, I don't really have time for rabbit trails, but what blows my mind, guys, is that in your <clears throat> darkest time, you know you better than anyone. And in your darkest time, Christ saw that and still chose to go to the cross for you and I. And what did that do? He was there on the cross, and he died, and he uttered the last words was, it is finished. He was buried in three days. He conquered the grave. And what the word of God says is that if you believe in this Savior, then you shall be saved. But it's not an intellectual belief. It's an effectual belief right? It's not mind knowledge. It's not like, hey, there's a chair. Good job. You pointed out a fact. No, it's effectual belief. Like, I believe that he is my savior and my king so much, it causes stuff to change. Like, if I believe that there was a chair there for real, I would sit in it, which you all are. There's actions there that come with this, and it's effectual belief. And the word of God is clear. It says that you shall be saved, but not only this a beautiful gift of salvation, but it also says that the same power 
The same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work in those who believe. That's resurrection power working with you. Man, isn't that good news? I don't know that you don't. Gosh, I get in trouble so much for saying silly things that, um, not really trouble, but I'll get an email occasionally of someone, I just disagree with what you said about addiction, but I'm telling you, when we're talking about the power of God, and he is your king and your Lord and Savior. Lord means he's your boss. You get that, right? So often people say, oh, he's my Savior. They don't like that Lord part. Lord's your boss, meaning I do what he says. He's my king. I joyfully do what he says when I can. Sometimes I begrudgingly do, but he corrects me in that. When he is your Lord and Savior and you have this, this power that raised him from the dead, the Holy Spirit within you working, addiction is nothing. Nothing. Don't be scared. Oh, man, I'm going to go down a trail and get in more trouble. But what this says, when it says that you're more than a conqueror, believe it. Not because Adam said it, because the God said it. We can't be victims anymore. We can't wallow around in the shame and guilt because he came and paid for it. He says he despises shame. Yes, you did it. You will have consequences. But you know what? Christ died for it. And if you either are swimming in this pit of shame and guilt, you'll never climb out. Or if you're wearing a mask, acting like it's not there and just, hey, brother, that's good. Either way, you're acting as though the cross didn't count for you. Start believing and preaching the, the promises of God to yourself. Why? Because it has power. It has power to overcome sinful desires, which gets us all in trouble. Gets us all in trouble. I'm way off my notes. But that's just the gospel. That's just the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is, is just a beautiful sentence of the gospel. It says this, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, remember that standard's perfection, righteous perfection. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become that righteousness. Perfect unity back with the Father. Walk in it. It's not about perfection. It's about progression after your salvation. You will mess up. Why? Because you still live in a fallen world. You still have a, a fallen nature all around you. But it's about progression. Here's what I'll tell you. The things that you struggled with in 2019 probably should look a little different in 2020 or you're not going to war. You're playing games with sin. We tell it how it is. I told you it stings sometimes. If you want to play games with sin, then do it. But you're, you have enough history to know that it ends badly, right? But when you've given your life and God rules the throne of your heart, there's freedom. The penalty of sin is erased. The power of sin no longer has dominion over you. And then one day you'll see your Savior face to face and the very presence of sin will be removed and you'll be back in perfection and paradise awaits you. That's why our vision is this again. Our vision at Spring to Life is to see addictions exchanged for a life liberated in Christ because the appeal of sin is no longer desirable. When you love Christ so much and you see like what we celebrated yesterday, what he came to do, like I, I say this a lot and I've even heard this before, but it, it's really mind-blowing that in the nastiness and the darkness, darkest place that I've ever been in, that's when the voice whispered through the darkness and light began to shine. And here's what God says to us. In those seasons, he says, I love you. What? I love you. That 
should change something in you. Otherwise, you're playing games. Not perfectly change, but change. Be in the fight. Be in the fight. Hate it. Hate the stuff that you used to giggle about. Hate it. Hate it. Hate the things that had its hooks in you. It owned you. You were a slave. I was. Did whatever it told me to do as often as I thought I needed to. Begin to hate that stuff that Christ died for. Don't play around with it. Don't giggle about it. Don't make jokes about it. Don't make light of it. Put it to death. It no longer has dominion over you. Stop playing in the arena with it. That's what the Word of God says. Definitely don't identify as it. Hey, I'm Adam. That's me. That's me. What? Oh, man, there's help. You got to get in the fight. I think the question could come up, and I'm wrapping up. The question could come up, well, how do I... Um, I don't want to have this desire. I don't want to have this um, appeal to sin. I don't want it to be desirable. And, and here's, here's just an illustration that I've used in the past. When I was in college, uh, I had three other roommates. <clears throat> and one time, one day, we went to a buffet, and um, I ate something that was not good. It did not sit well with my stomach. When we got back to our dorm... Um, man, I was getting sick, and I went to the bathroom, and I threw up everywhere. This is gross. Gross story, but track with me. <coughs> I got so sick that I had to go to the hospital. It was food poisoning. I was there for three days. Well, anybody know what college-age boys aren't going to do is clean up after someone, and so when I returned after three days, it was my duty to clean up the bathroom. You can imagine. Don't imagine. It's gross. But to this day... I can't eat that food anymore. I'm dead to that food. I saw the vileness that was once in me and is now all over the wall, and I had to scrub it and kill it. I can't eat that anymore the rest of my life. That's how. That's how sin is no longer desirable, desirable and it's, the appeal of it is no longer desirable because you see it for what it is. And when you surrender to Christ, you throw it all up, man. You throw it all out there. You don't hide it. You don't try to have secret sin growing in your life. You don't. No, I lay it all out, and it's disgusting to me. I no longer can eat that food. I no longer can be that guy. And if I do, if I walk into something, if my pride creeps in, or if I'm unrighteously angry, or whatever sin I indwells me today, I feel dirty. And I'm just like, no, that's not. I repent. I turn. I put it to death, but it takes fighting to put something to death. It takes fighting. All right, well, how do you get in the fight? So that's the desirable. Here's the practical way of getting in the fight, and it's just a mindset. <coughs> and you heard me say this before. If it's 3 in the morning and someone kicks your door in and their main objective is to kill you and take your family from you, what do you do? Huh? You pray for him? <laughs> Not me. I'm getting violent. There's always the one guy. I'm going to pray for him, Pastor. Are you? If someone kicks your door at 3 in the morning and they're going to kill you and take your family, you get violent. You don't in invite them to play Madden on Xbox or Call of Duty on PlayStation, whatever it may be. You get violent against that person to protect you and your family. And here's the kicker. Addiction does and sin does the same thing it will kill you and it will take your family many of you in the room have died from overdose and many of you have had relationships robbed because of addiction why are you not getting violent why are you content with playing xbox with it like it's cute <coughs> not against people not against the liquor store clerk, not against your drug dealer. You're not violent against people. You're violent against the temptation, the urge, the desire that tells you that, hey, this drink or this drug is the answer today for my boredom, oddly enough, is a big thing that people use, for my pain, for my fear, for my anxiety, for my life, from blah, 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 blah. 
No, I put that to death, and I get violent against that thought. I look to God who says I have a helper, and he says that you can escape these desires. God, you say it in your word that I can escape this. I need you right now because this is in my head. And you take that captive, but you've got to get violent. You've got to get violent. Not just block it out and act like it's not there. No, do work. Do work. I'm going to close with two scriptures. Um, if the team can kind of come back up. Two scriptures, and then I'm going to have a time of response, okay? And I want to talk to you guys about that. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Very popular. It's called the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, there's that word again. Here comes a fact. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. I've heard this passage preached so many times, and it's normally about missions and missionaries and preaching the gospel and making disciples and doing that. And that is actually the context of the verse. Jesus talking to them before he leaves. But man, get, get the bookends of, this, of these verses. He says, all authority has been given to me. All, not some. The one that breathes galaxies into existence, who commands storms to stop, and they listen and obey. He calls out unclean spirits, and they don't argue. He tells dead people that they're not allowed to be dead anymore, and they have to start breathing, and their heart starts pumping again as he raises Lazarus from the dead. All authority. All authority. All authority. And then the bookend ends with this. It says, behold, here comes an objective, observable fact. I am with you always to the end of age. You're not a victim. Is it scary? Yes. But fear is a liar. Is it hard? Sure. Sure. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it talks about Christianity is easy or living a life of freedom and, and sacrifice and loving the Lord is easy. But you know what it does say? That you would have it no other way. You see so many records of people getting beaten and refusing to accept release from torture and they leave rejoicing. It's, Jesus is enough. As you walk in this journey, as we're pulling up to the 2020 and you're wanting to know how to get in the fight and, it's, and you're unsure, know that he's with you, believer. If you are a believer, he is with you, the one that has all authority. Do you believe it? Will you trust him and will you commit your life? Will you ferociously fight If you would, if, if you've tasted this freedom, I want you to stand up. If you believe you've tasted freedom, stand up. This is in Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look around this cloud of witness. Run the race. Lean on family. Lean on brothers in Christ. Lay aside things that cling. Pointless things. Remember, he created you to bring him glory, not do silly, childish things. Put that stuff away. Watch what happens with your life. Watch how much more time you have in your life when you put away the silly things. You don't have to be defined by your past, described in your present, or hopeless looking to the future. 
Freedom is yours. And the one with all the power to break chains and set free promises to be with you to the end of age. Stay standing. Here's the call to respond. The gospel's been presented. Our theology and our philosophy on addiction has been laid out. I want you to listen to one woman's response to hearing that Jesus is here, that Jesus is in town. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster, an alabaster <coughs> flask of ointment and pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you, have always, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you could do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And that prophecy was fulfilled just then. This woman, there's other accounts and other gospels, but this woman, one account says she was a lady of the night, or a lady of the city, I'm sorry, which didn't mean she owned property in the city. It meant her occupation was a prostitute. Full of shame, full of guilt, full of pain. No one in society looked at her. She was considered a low-class citizen, and oftentimes people with addictions are considered second-hand citizens. And her response was, I hear that Jesus is in town. I feel the weight of my sin, and I don't know what to do. I know in this culture, it's really legalistic and religious, so I'm going to grab the most expensive thing that I own, the most valued thing that I have, and I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to waste it all on him. And she was scolded for it. Now, you guys, we're not asking you to physically give anything, but I think tonight in the time of response as they play the song, you need to lay down some things that you're holding on to so tight. Maybe it's comfortable to be in the pit. Maybe it's your pride. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's your way. You know how many times everyone has a plan of action and it's, I don't want to hear any advice. I don't want to, just whatever it may be, whatever you're holding on to so tight that's that block between you and Abba Father tonight, break it like the broken alabaster is the song that they're going to sing. What's keeping you from God? Give that up tonight. That's the call.
pour out my praise on you. You may be seated. Ron actually has another 45-minute sermon he's going to come and give, so you guys buckle in. Um, no. um, and then Bruce has about an hour one after that, so it's the marathon tonight. Hey, guys, just encouragement. Um, as you, the 26th, as you prepare for 2020, be strategic, spiritually strategic. Get rid of things that have its hooks. Get rid of things that could entangle you or slow you down from running the race. Man, if you have questions, ask. If you need to, to talk with God about salvation, do that. No longer allow the, the things of old to slow you down, guys. I'm encouraged uh, by the word and the promises of God that they're true. Now, let's believe it and act with an effectual belief. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God.